Hello, welcome to Braden English Aim Higher. This video we're going to be looking at Macbeth. This is designed for GCSE English Lit with Edexcel, but you can join us from any exam board, but your mark scheme might be slightly different to ours. In this video, we're going to be talking about robes and roles. So let's explore this mark scheme. Let's think about how we're going to achieve the top kind of 85% of our marks here. Looking at our marks, this, this particular question, which is part B, is out of 20. So we're aiming for 17 and above here. Let's take a look at the colours then. So we're looking to be assured, have assurance, be convincing and be integrated in our response. So being assured here, I've said it in previous videos, you sound like you know what you're talking about and you can only sound like you know what you're talking about because you have a full and comprehensive knowledge of the text. You show a level of engagement and you are discerning in your references. So you pick out the right stuff and you use it in a kind of um in an engaging way that your the way you use quotations makes your um, makes your response engaging to read, which I will try and show you a little bit later. But also this idea of maturity and perceptive understanding here. So using high level vocabulary and going a little bit further. Perceptive means to see that which others do not naturally see. And you can usually only do that by looking at the text very, very closely. So let's look at today's idea then. Have a look at these quotations. Feel free to pause if you want. These six quotations have one thing in common and they all have references or imagery of clothes. And I've grouped them into three little kind of mini teams here. They both, both of these have um, kind of little pairs of quotes. Let's look at the left hand side first of all. These two quotes belong to Act 1, Scene 3, when Macbeth is made Thane of Cawdor. And his response to this is, why do you dress me in borrowed robes? But Banquo replies to him, new honours came upon him like our strange garments cleave not to their mould but with the aid of use. So Banquo echoes this imagery of clothes here that the role that he has taken on might feel strange right now, but the more he wears the role, the more he kind of acts like Thane of Cawdor, the more natural it will feel. Similarly, look at him here arguing with Lady Macbeth, saying he had honoured me of late, and he's got these golden opinions, which should be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. And Lady Macbeth counters with, was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? So this here is where Macbeth has changed roles again. He's here trying to pretend that he is going to be a loyal subject to Duncan, despite the fact in the last but one scene, he's promised to Lady Macbeth that they are going to kill him. Much later on in the play, after all of Macbeth's kind of uh, thanes have abandoned him, they discuss him saying he cannot buckle his distempered cause within the belt of rule. And similarly, he feels his title hang loose about him like a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief. So this motif meaning a recurring image this motif of clothes and robes in the play is clearly very important but why is it important let's explore this on the next on the next page i think this imagery of clothes has all to do with the different identities or the different roles that macbeth takes on within the play so on the right hand side here these are a couple of the roles he plays at the beginning of the play he is a soldier he is a warrior he's worthy he is brave macbeth Later, he takes on the role of Thane of Cawdor, and this is a role given to him by Duncan. But then he decides to try and change his role slightly. He becomes what's known as a regicide, somebody who murders the king, or just more simply, a murderer. But this murderer is a different kind of killer to the soldier, isn't it? So he has changed his role slightly here. Similarly, he tries to maintain the idea of being a loyal subject. When he says, I don't want to kill Dunk, and he says, you know, he's honoured me of late and I don't want to cast aside these lovely kind of um, golden opinions that I want to wear in their newest gloss. He also tries to kind of trick Banquo that he is still a loyal friend to him. In Act 3, Scene 1, um, he's still talking about the fact that they, you know, have a, uh, they are linked together. He tries to be a good husband as well. And for the most of the play, he is. However, the one role of being a husband that Macbeth does not seem to be able to attain is being able to father children. So he kind of fails in this role as well. Similarly, about halfway through the play, after he's ordered the death of Duncan, he stops sharing and confiding in Lady Macbeth. So that role of husband is also lost to him. And of course, ultimately, he fails in the role of king. So Macbeth is awarded some sympathy here, I would say, that every single role he tries to play within the story, he fails at. And every time he fails a role or kind of um, tries to attain this new role, this imagery of clothes and costume, if you like, crops up in the play. Let's see how this is concluded then. 
So in Act 5, Scene 3, just after he's been told by the lily-faced um, servant, who he calls a goose face, he's, he's, he's told by this servant there are 10,000 English soldiers, you know, not too far away. And alone on stage, after he's sent everybody away, he says, My way of life is fallen into the seer, the yellow leaf, and that which should accompany old age, as honour, love, obedience, troops of friends, I must not look to have. So when he realises that his days are numbered, he thinks about the way of life, the roles that he has played and the things that would have gone with these roles that he can no longer have. So I've colour coded them here to show you. He cannot have honour that a soldier would have if he played his role correctly. He cannot have obedience that he should be owed from being Thane of Cawdor or being king. He cannot have troops of friends because he is a murderer. He is not a loyal friend. He is not a loyal subject. And similarly, he cannot have love because as a husband, he's not he's not confiding in Lady Macbeth. And similarly, they don't have a family together. So Macbeth himself recognises that in failing to fulfil these roles, he loses the good qualities that they bring to him in life. And this is summarised even better in the last part, nearly the last part of the play, the most famous speech coming up. Just after he hears about the death of Lady Macbeth, so his final role, if you like, of husband comes to an end, he gives this brilliant nihilistic speech. Now, nihilistic means to believe in nothingness. He says tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. This all our yesterdays could be all the choices he has made, all the roles he's tried to play. And he talks about himself being a fool here. And these things have all led him to dusty death. And it's beautifully kind of put into uh, into imagery here. He says, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player, like an actor who takes on a role, who struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. So he recognises that the different roles he has played, he has played badly, if you like. He has strutted and fretted about with these roles. And because he has not fulfilled any of these roles in the play as um, illustrated by the imagery of clothes, he is going to be, quote, heard no more. So that's quite a complex idea. Let's see how that would look written up. So let's read it. How does this look written up? Shakespeare uses the motif of clothes throughout the play to comment on Macbeth's changing roles. These images often appear when Macbeth attains a new identity. For example, when he becomes Thane of Cawdor, he says, why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Similarly, when Macbeth is purporting to be Duncan's loyal subject, not long after promising to kill him, he says the honours Duncan gave him should be worn in their newest gloss. Furthermore, in referencing giant's robes and the belt of rule, Shakespeare is suggesting that Macbeth's new roles never fit him. As a result of this, Macbeth himself recognises that honour, love, obedience, troops of friends he must not look to have. This imagery of dressing up to attain a new role is concluded in Macbeth's nihilistic soliloquy describing a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage. Shakespeare's message here is linked to the Jacobean belief in the great chain of being, which instructs man to remain at his destined level of the hierarchy. In challenging this hierarchy by attempting to change roles in the play, to regicide, to king, to loyal friend, Macbeth ultimately dooms himself to be, quote, heard no more. Let's now apply the mark scheme to this answer. Let's use the colours then. So in looking to achieve some maturity in my response, look at the red words here. This is high level vocab here. Motif here, meaning recurring image. Purporting, so like you're pretending to be something if you're purporting to be it. To attain, as in to, to gain something or to take on that role or to, to yeah, to gain is probably a better um, description of that. A nihilistic soliloquy. So nihilistic is to believe in nothingness, kind of like apathy, but a more depressed version of it that you think nothing will come from nothing. And a soliloquy is a solo speech. And this word hierarchy is linked to the idea of status. All the green here are different quotations. Now you can see I showed you loads earlier in the video, but I haven't used every single one and I've only used the most important bits of the bit of the ones that I have used. So a good range of quotations there from a lot of uh, a, a range of different places in the play as well. Your blue is your interpretation here, which I've tried to be perceptive about by thinking about this idea a little bit kind of outside the box, if you like. And the yellow is where I am linking into the relevant context. You must get context in for part B of Macbeth. Final thought then. Lady Macbeth also changes her role by invoking the spirits. Unsex me here, fill me from the crown to the toe, top full, direst cruelty. How is her unnatural change in identity punished? 
and why is it different to that of Macbeth? Thank you very much for watching.